This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And LinkedIn. LinkedIn has marketing tools to help you target your customers with precision. For a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit to launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. We've got a jam-packed news roundtable for you today. Tons of news. The scooter wars are, I think, settled here in San Francisco. A bunch of tech luminaries are uh, being grilled on um, in Capitol Hill today, Sheryl Sandberg and Jack Dorsey. And Lyft is getting ready to IPO. Tons of stuff going on. My guest today, Ian Thompson, is back. How are you? Always good. Always good. Uh, and uh, how was Burning Man? <laughs> it was good. It looks <laughs> you like wouldn't you wouldn't get me down there for love and money. I've just recovered from Black Hat and DefCon. I'm not heading down to another desert. DefCon is your personal Burning Man. Explain to the audience what DefCon is. Uh, DefCon is the largest collection of ha- the largest hacking conference in the world. Probably the most fun as well. Um, it's basically. Black Hat's where you go if you want to see what isn't in the manual. DEF CON's what you, where you go if you want to hack the source code, rip out the hardware, replace it with your own kit, and then do something really good with it. I knew I, I was not in Kansas anymore when I went to DEF CON about a decade ago with the Hackaday team, mm-hmm. and there were four ATMs in the lobby. Yeah. And I just thought, what lobby has four ATMs? Hmm. Yeah. You and they never, said, don't use the ATMs. No. you, you Don't uh, use the ATMs. You, I will walk three three hotels down to find an ATM rather than use the one at Def, use anything at DEF CON. It's fantastic. And they also took Tang and dumped it in the pool, made uh, the pool orange or red in the hotel. Tradi- yeah. The pool party is always traditional. Doesn't yeah. it stain your skin, though? I don't know. I, I mean, most people were naked, so I don't know. It's... It, I didn't see them get out, but they were dropping dry ice in there too. It's a, it's a little bit of chaos, right? Oh, it's it's absolute chaos. It's marvelous, but um... people would think it's nerds, but no, no, no it's, it's like these people know how to party. <coughs> oh yeah, no, definitely, and it's it's also one of the most, with the exception of Enigma, it's probably the most gender gender equal thing as well. A lot huh. more women there, a lot of families with kids as well. Huh. I, I mean, that is. yeah, why is that? I think it's, I think in part because. The kind of people that go to DEF CON were the kind of people that got the living hell beaten out of them at school before ah. being geeks. And so they tend to be a bit more accepting of, of people who... It seems who like a very tolerant group. Also with us today, Clara Brenner from the Urban Innovation Fund, investor here in Silicon Valley. Welcome. Hi. Second time on the News Brown Table, I think, That's or third? That's right. Second. Second time. All right. Everybody knows uh, Clara has given some amazing talks at our events, and uh, she's a great investor. Okay, let's get right to it. A uh, bunch of testimony today. Sheryl Sandberg and Jack Dorsey were uh, testifying in Congress about the horrible job that they, their companies, Twitter and Facebook, did in trying to uh, deal with spot with bots and disinformation. How did you guys think they did today? Any thoughts? Well, nobody really screwed up, uh, which is always a plus in the, in these sort of things. But at the end of the day. You know they've been so highly so highly media trained about this that <clears throat> they'll have they'll get a question you can almost see uh, flicking through the mental files and then okay this is the answer we give right blah, 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 blah. and it's it's all very anodyne and it's it's a public spectacle rather than trying to get stuff seriously sorted I can't help feeling what was your know. gut reaction that doesn't are you as cynical. Me. No, I mean, I think regardless of whether it's, you know, fireworks or not, just the fact that they've been compelled to appear and that they chose to do so and took the time to research and have good answers and they've, they're they taking it seriously to me is important and good. Mm. And, you know, I appreciated that they were there and it was interesting to me that Google didn't show up. Yeah. What is your thinking as to why Google would thumb their nose at Congress? This seems like a really stupid thing to do. You know, it does, and I, I don't know why. I mean, they control 90% of internet search traffic, so part of me thinks they're sort of above all of this, but I think it will have implications down the road for them, for felt sure. felt particularly arrogant to not come and it then was... to offer, like, your VP when you have the, you know, number mm-hmm. two and number one person at each of these companies, doesn't he? I think it was a mistake. Uh, I think it's an understandable mistake, given the lack of love that Google's getting from the administration at the moment, and I think maybe they're making a statement on that front. But I do think it was a mistake not to turn up, because this is after, as you said, uh, this is a bipartisan event. And if Congress require asks you to turn up, it's generally considered polite and 
a good move to show up. And in the UK, they can compel you. Oh yeah. To testify. Uh, and yes. they did with Zuckerberg, right? They told him if he doesn't come testify, they will pick him up at the airport and oh, bring him yes. there. Yeah. This has happened? Um, they th- Well, they threatened to. I don't think they've yeah. actually put the... I mean, you can be compelled to testify in the UK. Um, but, yeah, Facebook would just... When, when the Facebook hearings were held in the UK, Facebook were very dismissive about the whole thing. And it mm. was just like, why well, are we bothering? You've got 65 million people. There's, there's 7 billion out there. You seriously expecting me to waste an afternoon on this? What was fascinating to me was the amount of contrition. Uh, it seems like they're taking it deadly serious, um, which to me, um, I, th- I found it very bipartisan, hmm. intelligent. Um, Unusual for Congress. It was, it was pretty weird. Like They actually <laughs> were very informed, and they were very much on top. It, and it didn't hit this, like, Trump never came up, came up. Mm-hmm. And it felt like, and I don't know if it was because of McCain's funeral and his legacy being front and center in people's minds, but they did seem very collaborative. It didn't seem like everybody was trying to, you know, grind to certain acts that they had. And and the deplatforming of people didn't really come up as an issue, despite Alex Jones running around the place like a maniac trying in the hallway. Trying to pick a fight with right. Marco Rubio. Trying to pick a fight with Marco Rubio, patted him on the shoulder. Um, what do you guys think of the deplatforming of a lot of the right wing folks, Milo Yiannopoulos, et cetera, and then the deplatforming of Alex Jones, who obviously is. And there's a fair few left wing people who've been deplatformed as well. On the left, really? I don't yeah. know of one. Um, well, it's, uh, there's a couple of couple of people from uh, that, that were complaining at DEF CON oh. that uh, some of the socialist hackers group had been deplatformed. Oh. I wonder if they're anonymous accounts or actual. Well, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what do you think of Alex Jones being deplatformed from all of these, you know, YouTubes and Facebooks, and I guess Twitter suspended him and then let him back? And I, I, it's a really tricky one because on on one level, you should always you should always be prepared to listen to other people's arguments, but on the other level, he's totally irrational, and you can't argue with crazy people. Mm. Um, and some of the stuff that comes out of I mean. The parents of the Sandy Hook kids have been harassed to hell and back by this guy because yeah. he keeps on spouting these lies, yeah. and it's it's very it's a very so tricky vile. situation. Yeah. What I, do you think? There's about There's also a difference this? between protecting public speech, which is an incredibly American value, and you know protecting the public from dangerous speech, which is something mm-hmm. I think most people can get behind, and you know encouraging terrorism, for example, and you know harassing individuals who've gone through a public crisis is very different than, you know, sharing views that are perhaps just distasteful. And I think it's very reasonable for these platforms, not just reasonable, I would want that as a, as a customer for them to do it. And I don't think that's crazy. And as much as they're like a public square, they're, they're not, I mean, they're they're private companies 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 or, you know, and they're communities. So if you were a disruptive member of a community, that community might not invite you back to the golf club or tennis club or whatever club it was the next right. year. Like you're just too disruptive. You're not, they don't even have to give you a reason, but in this case, it does seem like they did the right thing, but it, it does seem like this is playing into the hands of the right, which wants folks to believe that they're being silenced by the left media. Yeah. Companies. Does that concern you at all, Ian? Uh, I, would, <clears throat> I think one, <clears throat> I think it's kind of sad because it used to be the Democrats were like the snowflake, the snowflakes who complained about everything that they were being persecuted, and now the Republicans have picked up that banner and boy, have they run with it! I mean, we is it Diamond and what's her face were complaining that they Diamond been, and Silk, Diamond and Silk were complaining they, they that, love Trump that they had been you know, censored on on Facebook, and then when you looked at the data, they hadn't been censored at all. Mm. Um, but that doesn't Bannon fit in with the narrative. Mind. Did you see this? Bannon got uh, kicked out of the New Yorker. Yeah, the event. Mm. I, I, I immediately was like, I want to see this. I want to see Remnick, you know, demolish him. And he's evil. And wouldn't it be great <clears throat> to have this interaction? Right. Yeah. And the only other people I saw in my feed who had that position were Malcolm Gladwell and Kara Swisher. Everybody else attacked Malcolm Gladwell, myself, and Kara Swisher for being right. like, what's the big deal about doing an interview what is the big deal about doing the interview? Do you think he should have been banned from the New Yorker Ideas Festival? You know, I think there's something to be said for exactly what you're saying, you know, dialogue. People should be able to share unpopular opinions, and that's 
one of the reasons why you, you generally want to protect people's speech on these platforms so they can participate yeah. and disagree. I think the challenge is that so many of these platforms and perhaps events like the event in New York don't ultimately facilitate actual free speech. It ends up being the loudest, the scariest, and oftentimes mm -hmm. it scares away women, for example, yeah. younger people, people from uh, disadvantaged communities. I mean, there was a really interesting article a few weeks ago about the challenges that female politicians are facing, even though there's this wave of politicians in the, the November midterms, that the crazy amount of, of harassment that they're experiencing is really preventing them from even running arguably... <coughs> Uh, the campaigns that they should be able to, um, that you would want in sort of like a fair fight. And mm. so I think that that is a concern as well. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. I would be happy to have him there and, and hear a debate as long as it was you know structured and everybody got their chance to have a I say, try. but I don't think that's what ha is happening most of the time. I think a debate is important. Just having him up there spouting his philosophy, that serves no real purpose. But right. actually debating him with someone, because he doesn't take any prisoners in debates. Put him up against someone who's a really good debater, and let's see how this turns out. Yeah, just interviewing him and letting mm. him spew nonsense. Right, is, mm. is horrible. Yeah, yeah but I like the idea of a, a vibrant debate. I think the other thing that tweaked people was um, he's not in a position of power anymore. He's been kicked out, so like, what other ideas does he have that we need to hear? Right. Like mm. other crazy racist start a third world war idea. Yeah. It's like the guy's a bit crazy. Well, he's been going over and talking to UK politicians and they're starting to get weird as well now mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah. All right, when we get back, we're going to talk about the scooter wars and uh, who got um, a license and who didn't here in the Silicon Valley and should these even be allowed? Uh, I know we're beating this dead horse, but uh, the horse is, has, has risen again because the scooters are back. Or it will in October. Or they will in October, and we'll get an update on that in just a second. Hey, if you have a great idea and you want to turn it into a beautiful new website, use Squarespace, where you can blog or publish content, sell products and services of all kinds, and promote your physical or online business, announce an event, or do a special project. Of course, you know you'll get beautiful templates that are customizable and power e commerce, powerful e commerce functionality that's optimized for mobile. And you can buy domains, choose from 200 plus extensions, get great analytics, and you will get free and secure hosting and their 24 by 7 award-winning customer support. We use it all the time. Go check out the Launch Angel Summit or Launch Festival, Launch Festival Sydney, or Launch.co, all running on beautiful Squarespace sites. So here is your call to action, everybody. Go to squarespace.com and get a free trial. Then, when you're ready to launch, use the promo code TWIST and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Squarespace, make beautiful websites and get all that powerful e-commerce functionality and you'll be optimized for mobile. It's a really great service. We love it and use it here every day. Clara, what's going on with these uh, scooter wars here in San Francisco? And where do you stand on it since you've made a career of making cities better? Do these scooters make cities better or not? Yes or no? I think generally, yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, expand it. Thank you for a yes, no. I mean, nobody <laughs> will just say yes or no. So they, right, your position is it. they make cities better. Mm -hmm. Why? And then why do they make cities better? And then why are people so tweaked about it? I think multimodal transit is really important. You know, you can't just take a bus. You know, you need to get that last mile. And there are lots of different ways to to solve that last mile. But I think having uh, options is good. Um, I think... What's happening in San Francisco, and for those who don't know yet, the city has essentially come out with its permits for a certain number of scooters, scooter companies, two companies, yeah. and a bunch were shut out. Huh. Um, and so it ended up being uh, Scoot and Skip. Huh. So not any of the biggest players, let's say. And so they beat Lyft, Jump, Bird, all of those other folks. Yeah. Wow. So, is that the city giving a message to those people who went rogue and just dropped them? Yeah, it is, mm, in a big like, way. It's exciting. I mean, I think it's it's good that cities are exerting a little bit of muscle to control the situation because it was getting out of control. And frankly, when you have all of these players in the market, it's really just a race to the bottom. Everybody had the exact same product. Um and so basically what they decided to do was offer two permits, two companies. I think they each start with 600 or so scooters. Yeah, 625 each. And then they get to double that in six months. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that they'll have control of this market forever. In six months, other players could theoretically come into the market if they're not doing a good job. But the idea is when you limit competitors, I think, um, 
geographic equity uh, is more likely to happen because geographic equity. Well, if you had you know ten companies in the market, they're all going to compete for the few geographic areas where there are the most users, for example. Ah. But um, if there are only two players in the market, they're going to be more inclined to spread out. Mm. Um, and I think that's one of the goals of the city. And I think startups, especially in the transportation space, are starting to understand that if you play good political ball you can win. And that's mm. really what happened here. I mean, Scoot, for example, has had a really good relationship with the city for a long time. Um, and Skip didn't launch without a permit, unlike their competitors. And I think uh, Lyft and Uber also got dinged because they had a lot of historic infractions or something. Uh -huh. um, but that doesn't mean they're always going to lose. I mean, in Santa Monica, a different set of companies won. But the uh -huh. point is there was a process, and I think that's good. And here we see this scooter share pilot program, SF. MTA <clears throat> application assessment, and they did an actual assessment on disabled access, equitable access, community outreach, labor, sustainability, experience and qualifications, and they gave people strong, fair, and poor ratings. Uh, and that's super interesting because they, they gave Bird some very poor ratings Yeah. down yeah. the line. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, look at all those poor. And that's the most funded, highest uh, valued company of all of them. How did they blow it? Well, you know, they've taken a very cavalier approach, which in some places has worked. And for some companies like mm. Uber, for example, historically mm. that's worked, which is you just show up, you go nuts and people love it. And then you deal yeah. with the fallout later. Um, but I think cities are getting much savvier about it yeah. and more sophisticated about getting what they want out of the deal. And so startups moving forward need to be, I think, a little bit more thoughtful about how they approach these cities. Which you predicted, and you've I been did. saying for five years, since we've met, yeah. you've been saying this constantly, which is like, hey, get to know the people in office and work with them. Don't just like drop your scooters or, right. you know, yeah. break every rule and thumb your nose. And that doesn't mean they'll end up being successful. Like in six months, you know, a, another company could come along with yeah. a better and differentiated product. But I, I mean, I think there are also some very legitimate concerns that people have raised about, you know, it's one thing to sell a good story, but the two companies that won are arguably some of the youngest and poorest like least funded, let's say. Um, mm. And so companies like Lyft and Uber, while they have made mistakes in the past, they have huge operational capabilities in terms of like actually being able to deliver a solution that meets the needs of the most citizens at scale. Yeah. They're probably, Uber's going right to crush now, it because they bought <clears throat> Jump, which we had on the podcast. Right. And <clears throat> Jump on the podcast kind of tipped their cards a bit that they were going to do scooters. So they're doing scooters. So yeah. that's going to be pretty powerful. You could take... If you can't get an Uber or there's a lot of traffic, you could just take a scoot to or the just BART. think if you pulled up an Uber and it literally planned, you know, you start with a car and then you get in a on a bike or you get in a scooter. And, yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. that is the ideal situation. And they're probably the most capable of delivering it, which means I suspect that these winners will probably end up getting scooped up in the next few months. And <clears throat> parking seems to be one of the big problems. Is there a solution? into this parking problem and <laughs> you're so curmudgeonly and upset generally speaking i gotta think that you hate this am i wrong or am i right i, I was mean actually on the way here i was i was having a chat with a taxi driver about san francisco's parking authorities because those people are absolute nazis and they you know you leave a car slightly too far away from a curb wham ticket straight away perfect but parking is a big parking and traffic are both big issues and quite frankly uber and lyft have made traffic an awful lot worse um, we've seen, do you remember that a couple of years ago there was that ridiculous startup that came up with the idea of auctioning off parking spaces? We got pitched yes. by all of them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and this these was guys, crazy. These guys were just like, well, you know, it's move fast and break things. Let's do it. And the city were like, no, that's actually illegal. You know, uh, we had a great quote from one of the city fathers who was just like, <clears throat> This is the equivalent of saying, oh, no, I'm not a drug dealer because I'm just telling people where drugs could be purchased and how much. <laughs> I'm just but pointing I'm them not to a it. Drug dealer. Yeah, this, uh, to explain to the audience, they were taking actual public parking spaces mm -hmm. and letting people auction them off. So I could go squat on a parking space and right. then auction it off to somebody is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Yeah. Now, the in London, my understanding is people could, there's a, it's a big tradition now of renting your garage or driveway yes. in the day so oh, if you, you go to work and you can way. make a fortune but you have congestion pricing in london yes explain this and why this is miraculous um, basically london was in the early 90s gridlocked i mean it was there was if somebody did a, a very interesting uh, simulation if you had four ac accidents at key points in london you could gridlock the entire city for days um <laughs> 
So what they introduced was congestion charging, which means you have to pay a certain amount to drive within. Initially, it was just within the city. Now they've extended it slightly out. They've got camera vans going around so that, you know, if you, your car is photographed and you haven't paid, then you get a fine. And you have to have like an easy pass, right? Like you, yeah, it automatically gets charged, right? I tell you what, yeah. we've been pitched by a number of companies trying to help facilitate curb management or some kind of congestion pricing, even in the Bay Area. Um, either, you know, is it some kind of sticker you put on the car and then you help, essentially like an easy pass, you help cities yeah. administer it. Mm. Or, you know, I think there is a flight to order and everybody got really excited about these dockless options for bikes and scooters. But the two companies that won for at least the scooter war of the moment, both had proposals for lock to systems that they haven't built yet. Huh. But the idea is at least you have to lock it to something to manage the mm -hmm. sidewalk. and some Detrius everywhere. Right. Or some people are saying like the reason why Motivate, for example, was acquired, um, the bike share system by Lyft, is that they control a huge amount of sidewalk space. And mm. that's incredibly valuable, whether it's for locking systems or charging yeah. or whatever. But ultimately, you don't want all that shit everywhere. You need it managed in some way. I it think this is probably the most important and instructive <sighs> photo of our time. This is Jeff Fowler from the uh, Washington Post and previously the Wall Street Journal. Nice right. guy. A dude on a scooter wearing Magic Leap. I think this is pretty much the sign that it's the end of days. Like I think <laughs> this is one of the four horsemen that San Francisco is about to fall <laughs> off into the Pacific and we're, we're all going to float out to the Farallon Islands. I mean, what an epic disaster yeah. this is in one photo. Two startups that are worth billions of dollars and are both hated <laughs> tremendously. Well, but I now think... people are going to be parking these inside of stores, right? I think there was a story about maybe this would be um, if retail outlets allowed you to park them inside of the retail outlet, mm -hmm. that would be like a great way to get people into the Starbucks or the restaurant or whatever, maybe some parking like that. Could work, but the problem is uh, floor space is so expensive in San Francisco that if mm -hmm. you've got to set aside dedicated floor space for these things, then that's going to hurt the shop's bottom line. But, I, I mean, I agree with what you were saying. This this that whole metric that the, the, the council put up was basically just a way of not getting sued so that they could really shaft, jump, and and, uh, <clears throat> we had a process. and and bird and the rest of it who just dump these things on the street. Yeah. I don't know if it's just not getting sued, but it's also setting a really good precedent for other cities to say, mm -hmm. like, figure out what you want out of your mm. partnerships. And different cities want different things. You know, Pittsburgh, for example, has been really forward thinking about attracting autonomy and autonomous vehicles. Maybe yeah. they want different things than a city like San Francisco does, but put it out there, say what you want, and then you pick the winners that do it, and everybody else sh is not going to mm. be allowed to play. People hate these bird scooters so much in Santa Monica and Venice that I was talking to a group of people, <clears throat> and this one guy's like, anytime one of those is in front of our houses, mm. we pick them up, yeah. and we throw them, we break them, first right. we just smash them mm -hmm. and then we throw them in the garbage and then if anybody asks me he's like there was a broken scooter on my front lawn and yeah i didn't know whose it was so i threw it away so they literally are getting thrown into but i guess they don't cost that much so i guess it's the oh, cost of doing business co well they don't cost i mean when, when they first came out we started looking into them and it's like well should we give that a shot and it's like well you know it's only a dollar a ride plus a small charge but there is the cost of your dignity but i think also the you know there's a potential legal problem here in that i've seen people using these scooters and i haven't seen a single person wearing a helmet and the minute somebody gets injured then the lawyer this is the land of the lawsuit after all yeah. so the lawyers are going to fly um in santa monica i saw the santa monica police set up like a drunk driving kind of sting mm -hmm. where they were just on a street corner yeah Everybody who came by the Santa Monica Promenade without a helmet got a ticket. Yeah. And so that's definitely in play. When we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some security shenanigans and Lyft's IPO when we get back. Hey, let me take a moment to thank our friends at LinkedIn. When you advertise on LinkedIn, which is the world's largest professional network, you have the opportunity to build long-term relationships with critically important customers. And these translate into high quality leads, web traffic, and higher brand awareness. But the first step is to find and target the right audience. Every day, 500 million professionals engage with content on LinkedIn. A half billion people and your future customers are among them. You know this because you're on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn has marketing tools that will help you target these customers with precision down to their job title, company, and industry. So if you wanted to target people in the scooter business or who work at Uber or Lyft or in transportation or in government, you could pick their job title, their company, and their industry. And this will let you create a great message that customers care about. In fact, 
Four out of five customers on LinkedIn are decision makers at their company. You know this because you're on LinkedIn and you're a decision maker and you're listening to This Week in Startups. So get on there, use LinkedIn marketing and build these really important relationships. And here is a ridiculous, unbelievable, absurdly generous call to action. Get $100, a C note from your boy, Jason, by going to linkedin.com. Try to keep it together, people. LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups. Now, you got to type out all those characters. LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups, the podcast you're listening to. And if you type in those characters, you get about $10 per character, 100 bucks, in ad credits. Terms and conditions apply. Like, don't, uh, don't run a scam. But for everybody else who's not running scams, go to LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups and grab the C-note, a hundy from your boy. All right. Thanks again, LinkedIn. Uh, looks like Lyft is preparing for their IPO. And uh, this is the busiest summer since 2014. 70 to 90 more U.S. IPOs that could raise $20 billion by the end of the year, according to Renaissance Capital. Uh, and this would be a big deal, uh, wouldn't it? The Lyft IPO. It would be. Uh, you know, I was actually surprised that Uber hasn't gotten its stuff together yeah. before but i think for lyft it's, it's more of a competitive advantage than a problem for yeah. uber it's great if they go out first actually i think for uber mm. i think it's good because they're going to get Test value the well also it's like if you like lyft you're going to love uber it's four whatever five times bigger mm-hmm. um but boy is this going to be make the city go supernova there are so many employees of lyft and Uber, and yeah. now SurveyMonkey is going public as well, and then Airbnb behind it. What is yeah. this going to do to the Bay Area when these companies go public? It's already so dysfunctional it's, here. It's going to drive up prices even more, and you won't be able to get a coffee for under 10 bucks. It's just... Um... Turn it to Norway. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, but without the advantages, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, Norway's great, because, yeah, okay, everyone's, you know, everyone's paid an awful lot, and everything's very expensive, but they use that for, you know, things like free medical care and free education. Over here, it's just going to drive inequality even, even even more severely onto the table. I mean, uh, it's a serious issue. Is there any solution, Clary? This is your speciality. I mean, we've never seen so much wealth created in such a concentrated area that is so nimby that doesn't yeah. want to create housing. Well, we have a new mayor who is very, has come out sort of very strongly for new building permits, for example, mm. and other steps that I think are the practical right steps to start to deal with these issues. There was actually a really interesting panel, I want to say it was yesterday at SPUR, which is the urban mm. research and policy organization here in the Bay Area about turning the Bay Area into one municipality right and because sort of, it's like a hundred <clears throat> yeah mm-hmm. so n- everybody can point to everybody else in filibuster right? right you have oakland berkeley san francisco proper hillsborough san mateo milbrae right. atherton these are all separate communities people don't realize that yeah and so coordinating is really challenging and mm-hmm. it should be a regional effort um mm-hmm. and so there's some thought that that would do it i mean that's a very far off possibility but those are the types of steps that would be necessary to kind of rein in some of the craziness that's happening around here yeah, it seems like Redwood City did the best job of any area in the Bay Area of planning out and building units. I mean, they had some master plan, from what I understand, that just created thousands of units. I don't know if you've been down there in the last couple of years, but it is. It's like a building mm-hmm. storm. It's unbelievable how the many East Bay apartments. Is getting its act together on this front as well. I mean, is it El, really? El Cerrito and, and Richmond are both are both um, putting it, allowing sort of larger condos to go up. This is north of Berkeley for people who yeah. are listening. So if you go out east of San Francisco over the Bay Bridge and then north of Berkeley and Oakland, mm-hmm. there are Richmond yeah. and El Cerrito, which are emerging areas. Well, they're on the BART line, you see. So they they have yeah, the, the they, they have the communications, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's it's got to be done because, and I know it's unpopular because if you've if you were lucky enough to buy a house in Silicon Valley in the 90s, then that's your retirement plan sorted out. And people don't want to see their house prices go down, which they think will happen if more units go up. But what's the alternative? It's going to strangle Silicon Valley unless we can get this situation I, sorted out. I think it's out. already happened. I, you know, I was a big proponent of people coming here and moving their companies here. And now, in good conscience, I'm like, ah, I think you should leave your company in Florida and get yeah. like a WeWork or a bespoke space or something and have like a corporate office here, mm-hmm. but leave the sales team and the dev team and whatever else you can leave in Miami or right. Toronto. We just opened a Toronto office. Did you? Yeah. No. We, ha- we had one uh, employee in Toronto. We mm-hmm. just hired a second. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I can't find 
as many good people as we need in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. The tenure of a San Francisco employee is what? A year and a half? Right. Yeah. And people leave are, I think it's 50% plus of people in San Francisco report that they're planning on leaving San Francisco. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. more people left last year than came, apparently. That's fantastic. That is fantastic or disturbing, either way. Both. <laughs> I think that's why rents probably but were stable for a year. Yeah. Well, that, is that people have given up? New construction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, not enough, but there was more. I think also a lot of the people leaving weren't the kind of people that we actually want to leave. They're the, they're the teachers and the policemen and the and the you know the sanitation workers yeah. who genuinely just can't afford to live here. So they go somewhere else and maybe commute in for three or There's four hours. There's some interesting initiatives though, like Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, for example, has really made it there. Thing. And I think you're starting to see more tech philanthropy focus on the region, which is mm. not something historically that you've seen around Which here. is fascinating when you think about the Zuckerbergs because East Palo Alto, which is the most affordable area, I think, in the peninsula, right. is now becoming the place where they're doubling and tripling the rents because Facebook employees are moving to East Palo Alto, right. mm. which was supposed to be like the most dangerous, like you don't want to even drive through there. And now yeah. people are like, yeah, people are like, yeah, I'm tripling the rents and I'm renting to... Yeah. We Facebook see a ton employees. of companies around this trying to solve the space, and I'm not sure any of them will do it. But mm. whether it's you know facilitating fractional ownership or saying like we'll do special financing if you're a teacher, for example, and mm. I, know, I think Chan Zuckerberg is actually invested in one of those uh, companies. That specifically wait, wait, explain targets. what that means. So the idea is they specifically develop housing for. Uh particular types of individuals, the idea being maybe you're not based the highest, on career, based on career, and maybe you don't have the highest income, but it's a very reliable income. You're employed, say, by mm -hmm. the unionized, you know, city and county of San Francisco. Teacher, doctor. Right. Um, and so perhaps you could provide more competitive housing by putting everybody together and offering them a special package. I'm not sure it makes business sense venture business sense no but a lot of them are trying to make it venture business sense yeah mm. i tweeted mm. i don't know if you saw my tweet over the weekend i was down at gilroy gardens which is a charming little uh amusement park yeah down in gilroy mm -hmm. gilroy is a town south of san jose uh and it's i guess an hour and a half from the city and maybe 45 minutes from you know atherton and palo alto mm -hmm. those kind of places and i was just looking at it thinking wow why don't we just make Gilroy or, you know, going north Petaluma where Leo Laporte is with uh, This Week in Tech. Why don't we just build a city there in mm -hmm. one of those places? Why hasn't that happened here, do you think, Clara? Well, there's something to be said for economic opportunity. You know, just because you're there doesn't mean anyone else that you need to engage with is there. Right. I think what's been interesting is the is the rise of the opportunity zone. People keep asking us about that in yes. the last few weeks. Explain what that is. Okay, so it's basically a, a tax advantaged investment opportunity. If if people make long term investments, I think it's over ten years in certain regions that are economically disadvantaged, and there are over a thousand of them that have been identified by the U.S. government. The government decides what's a disadvantaged place, and like Oakland has a bunch. Correct. There's a modest amount in the <clears throat> peninsula, like I think Millbrae. Or yeah. That kind of area. And they're, they're across the U.S. And the idea is, you know, how can we drive capital to these other places where people should be living mm. and make it appealing enough for investors to who are inherently risk averse to try it? Um, and there are a bunch of funds that are popping up. I know there was a venture fund that was announced yesterday specifically focused on investing in businesses in Opportunity Zones. Fundrise. Oh, yeah. A Fundrise, where I used to work, which is essentially like a, like a betterment for private real estate assets. Mm. Um, they have a new opportunity zone fund specifically we're only going to invest in real estate in opportunity zones i think it's interesting it's really interesting i think what happens is if you were selling your airbnb stock or your uber or lyft stock let's say yeah and you made 10 million bucks i'm just picking a random number and you had some amount of capital gains a couple million bucks you could invest in that community buy a building renovate it right. and you know move a company in there and then that tax I think after five years, you would get half of it back, or after 10 years, you would get all of it back. Something like that. So it's essentially found money if you've got a 10-year window to do it. Yeah. Then I was hearing that if you put companies in there, those companies would get some sort of tax advantage, but it seems unclear what the rules of the road are. People are trying to figure this out right now. It's Yeah. I mean, people ask us, like, are you going to start be, you know, investing in opportunity zones? I don't think that's going to be appropriate for us anytime mm. soon. Um, but who knows? Um, I think the idea of encouraging companies to move to a different city is just 
complicated. Like unless it's a super well-funded company, I don't know. I, I, we, I a think, lot to ask. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. And I'm just like, I think if I bought a warehouse building in Petaluma or a warehouse building down in Gilroy, yeah. and I just told folks like, you could have free office space here and your company could be, instead of being in Miami or Toronto, you could be with a 45 minute drive of Santo Road or an hour and 15 minute drive of the city. I think that would be better for our startups than being all the way there. I'm not sure. Maybe, but I mean, there's something to be said for quality of life. People want yeah. to live in dense urban environments. Yeah. I mean, that's our whole thesis as a fund is yeah. that you know 81% of Americans now live in and around cities not because it makes financial sense all the time, but because they want to be there. Mm. Um, so saying, go to Petaluma, as much as I love Petaluma, I don't think, even if it was cheaper, I don't know how many people would take you up on it. We just have to like get somebody like Google or Facebook or Airbnb to just be like, we're going to build a, like, a community up there. Santa yeah. Rosa is mm. burnt out now, right? There's yep. a huge fire, so that seems like an opportunity there. If they're rebuilding anyway, why not rebuild it? Although, unfortunately, the fires have left accommodation nearly as unaffordable as San Francisco because mm. so many homes went up in smoke. Yeah. Um, well, we have an investment in Blockable, so like, I wonder if they could just drop a thousand homes or something like well, that. Well, Facebook's building its own homes now. It's, it's they own, are, right? It's own, yeah. its own uh, homes now as well. Yeah, you saw the tour for uh, Bumblebee Spaces. I you did know, see Bumblebee Spaces. You're an housing. investor in that. Uh-huh. Bumblebee Spaces are very cool. Yeah. That's, and they're focused specifically on employee housing yeah. as that's one of their sort of target markets. So they're essentially a robotics furniture company where it's sort of like a um, uh, Murphy bed for the future. They store everything in the ceiling. So your bed, your closets, everything with a push of a button literally gets hoisted into the ceiling. And the idea is how do you make smaller spaces more that's actually appealing. rather cool yeah it yeah we had cool. him on the podcast it's, it's pretty cool you go into the room and there's like a couch and a desk and you're like oh this is like your sitting area your office mm. and it's like yes and you go over to like a little ipad and you press beep beep boop and all of a sudden the bed comes down cool. <laughs> and then your side tables come down and your closet yeah. comes down the closet's right. the best part because you're like oh i just put all my suits and my dress shirts up there boom you press the button it goes <clears> up so it you remember in the fifth element when mm. um yes. Bruce Willis comes home and he like puts his gun and he puts his ID and like everything's yeah. going into these like little compartments in the ceiling. Yeah, it's it's exactly moment. that. And their target market or one of their major target markets is employee housing because so many companies are looking to build housing for their. Oh, here oh, we there go. You go. Look at there's me. That's me. There's you. And here's That's the, the house. Button. And I'm like, what is going on here? I'm scared. This thing's going to fall on my head. But they it's a Tesla engineer who did this. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons we did it. We were like, this is really out there, but the team is so fantastic. They're yeah. really on it. Yeah. See, there's the, uh, that's Concussion. the bed and he's okay. standing literally under the bed. Yeah. And I'm like, what happens when your kids jump on this and try to lift? Cause that's like what kids are going to do. Right. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, it's got a weight sensor. If there's weight on the bed, it doesn't go up. He has one in his kitchen in his own house that they use for storage and all his, his children have used it and it's, there's a cute video of them. Actually. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I think it's going to work. Uh, yeah. All right. There it goes. <laughs> We're watching it go down now? I don't know. It, for a second. Yeah, they're Thank trying you. to find it here. Okay. You can keep scrubbing. Uh, all right. So uh, some security shenanigans. Um, BitFi, a John McAfee-backed hardware <laughs> crypto wallet firm. <laughs> I'm watch Did you, by the way, just to... Oh, here it is, by the way. We're watching here. That's the pulley system, mm -hmm. which okay. is actually... It's not a pulley, it's a... Oh, so it's got a camera to make sure there's no one standing underneath yes, it. Yes, and side. it's got a yeah. camera to record what goes on in your bed. Yeah. I was like... That's exactly uh, right. It's like, it's a little <laughs> creepy, right? He's like, yeah, we got to think about the camera in the They're bed. They're doing yeah. motion sensors now. They're doing motion sensors now. I was like, yeah, I think you're going to want to just get rid of that bed because if that got hacked, that would be not good. Yeah, um, we'll just put a physical cap on But the in the it. closets, they have cameras, which is kind of neat because then you could pull up your thing and be like, oh, where are my keys? So they're identifying with computer vision what's in your closet it's kind of neat. It's still a little creepy. Um, yeah, I, you see, I don't even, I even have one of these sort of echoes or personal home assistants in the house. I do neither. my stuff manually. I refuse to have them in the house. Yeah, um, I'm a little concerned about that as well. Yeah, I do not. You should be. Yeah, you really should because it, it's we've got recording a generation every... who. It is. I mean, already. I mean, your phone is recording everything, but. Yeah. Well, that's just for the NSA. Come on now. We're just trying to stop terrorism <laughs> good with guys. that. Um, but speaking of uh, security, mm. John McAfee's hardware bay hardware. Uh backed crypto wallet got hacked the oh, unhackable it's... got hacked if you just yeah. said the first few words that just came out of your mouth you should know it's problematic like right off the bat 
Yeah, John McAfee. I mean, yeah. Did you yeah. watch this documentary uh, about John McAfee on <clears throat> Netflix? Yeah. I'm halfway through it. It is bonkers. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, this guy is insane. Oh, oh, almost certainly clinically. I mean, he's. I mean, he's. No he was good. making drugs in the middle of the Costa Rican jungle or something. Yeah. It's like bath salts, apparently. Yes. Was it uh, bath salts? Apparently, it was bath salts, but um... the things that people like make people into zombies. Ah, uh, well, it's it seems to have worked for him, but um... <laughs> but he's taken seriously. Ah, uh, well, no, the... he's twelve pounds of crap in a ten pound bag. I mean, it's just he's he put out this tweet um, recently with just you know I founded the cybersecurity industry. Like, no, Doctor Solomon's actually did, and you just made got it, but did a halfway decent product and then bought someone else's in. You know, it's he makes it, and the minute you say something is unhackable, you know, some the person saying it doesn't know what the hell they're talking about because there is nothing on the planet that is unhackable. Um, the five eyes nations, yeah, this is I've this never is heard disturbing. that term. What does the five eyes mean? Uh, it's what Winston Churchill used to call the English speaking peoples it's America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Hmm. Um, left and, Ireland out of there, I guess. Uh, historically, quite kind of touchy, you know. It's um, in South Africa and South Africa. Yeah. Well, yeah, but again, politically, South Africa was kind of touchy at the time. But yeah, this is it, it's an interesting example of how we've basically won the encryption debate and lost the battle and won, and lost the war. Um, Explain. Well, what the for for years the FBI and others have been saying we need to install a backdoor in encryption, which is a fundamentally stupid idea because mathematically you can't put a backdoor in encryption that only you can find. And if you tell people there's one there, China and Russia are going to do Manhattan-style projects to find it. So instead, what this what the official communique said, and they invited you know tech companies there, and they all said no, was okay. We're not going to break encryption, but we are going to legislate so that we get access to the device. And as we've seen with a lot of the Mueller stuff, you know, you can use Signal and secure apps all you like, but if they get the phone and they, they and you haven't deleted your messages, they're still there and you and you can get them. So it's an interesting shift in terms of law enforcement. Uh, and we're going to see, I think, a raft of legislation out there which will give law enforcement access to your devices, whether you like it or not. Do you think uh, Apple should unlock terrorist phones when subpoenaed? Because they've taken the stand, they're not going to unlock, and then... Well, they say that they can't. They say they is, can't, yeah. which means they set it up so they can't. Yes. Bill Gates, <clears throat> I believe, said, like, that they should. Yeah, Bill's, um, yeah, he, he didn't cover himself with glory on that one. But, I mean, you can see the argument for it, and the FBI's cherry-picked some very nice test cases um, with the San Bernardino, for example, but... You know, and they said, well... The mass shooting, uh, yeah. that couple who did the mass shooting, yeah, their who, phones are locked... Well, they no, they destroyed all but one of their phones, and the one phone was his work phone. And the FBI said, well, we can't get into it. Apple needs to create the software that allows us to get into it. And when Apple said no, they found, then they found an Israeli company who could break into it. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's possible to do. I get very nervous, though, when people say, well, you need to build your operating system so that we can get into it. Because if you can get into it, someone else can get into it. And mm. Apple doesn't want the responsibility for this. Um, and the government will say, well, well, we'll keep the keys safe. It's like, yeah, tell the Office of Personnel Management that. You managed to lose the security clearances for the entire U.S. government, including their fingerprints. But I guess the challenge is you're managing for the worst-case situation, which is the San Bernardino situation. And yeah, or worse. Or, or worse, and yeah. you absolutely want to bring those people to justice. And I don't know how you square that circle, but the idea of just saying, well, it's hard, to me, is problematic. Mm. Some places have just banned encryption, right? In the Middle East, there's countries that just have uh, banned yeah, having I mean, encrypted phones. You're just not allowed to have them. The Indian government went head-to-head -head with RIM as well as BlackBerry is now because they wanted access to BlackBerry servers. And it wasn't entirely clear whether BlackBerry said yes or no. Um, uh, encryption is a really tough one because you know, good encrypt our entire e-commerce system depends on solid, unbreakable encryption. Our private messaging systems depend on it. But law enforcement got used to having full access to electronic devices in the 80s and 90s and early noughties. And then when encryption came in, they started, well, hang on a second. We're going, the, the phrase they use is going dark. And they're like, well, hang on. Now encryption's starting to really kick off. We need to be in a position to counter this. 
and to my mind it's a little bit lazy a little bit of laziness because they got used to having it so easy for so long you know we've only had computers in mass markets for the last 20 or 30 years law enforcement worked fine for the previous 100 100 or so but that's totally different now like i don't keep my money in a vault you know i my files are not in my box under my bed you yeah. know they're they need to be accessed i mean this is not my area of expertise but i have to assume allowing the government full access all the time doesn't seem like the ideal but access with the you know with the warranty. warrant seems good yeah the, the yeah. problem is though i think from what i'm getting from your saying in is once you put in any kind of backdoor to encryption mm. the the motivated nation state is going to get in there oh and, criminal. and then the whole thing is cracked yeah i mean and criminals as well i've interviewed uh, this has been an area of study for me so i mean i've interviewed you know, Winfield Diffie and Bruce Schneier and a bunch of other people about this, and they're like, look, we can't change the maths. If you put a back door in there, and particularly if you put a back door in there and mandate by law it's got to be in there so everyone knows it's there, then criminals, Russia, China... will find it. Uh, yeah, they will, they will spend billions trying to find it because once they've found it, everything's an open book. It's the perfect spying tool. So what's the answer? We still haven't worked out the answer yet, to be honest. I mean, it's... I think... There's an element of, speaking personally, and this is going to cause offence to some people, but I think people really need to grow up about this sort of thing. You know, okay, the San Bernardino shooting, it was terrible how many, a couple of dozen people killed maybe. You know, more people die in traffic accidents every year. I mean, I, it's one of the things that shocked me in the 10 years I've been in the US. It's what complete wusses you are about terrorism. I grew up with an IRA bombing campaign. You get used to it. Um, and the argument is, you know, oh, we shouldn't have to get used to it. Well, that's the way the world works. Well, we've been lucky that we live on essentially an island yeah. away from all the people who would do us harm. It's not easy to get here to blow stuff up, and when people do, it's a unique experience. It's not but like living I, I in Israel where they can just lob bombs on you all day. Is mm. that a fair trade-off, though? Like, wow, you get to order a coffee mug in the middle of the night, but you have to live with increased risk of unsolvable terrorist acts like to me that doesn't seem like the kind of They're not unsolvable thing. though i mean terrorist uh, terrorism acts are generally caught by good old-fashioned police work are they uh, i thought they caught them a lot because of like intercepting communications uh there's some there's some communications intercepts but if you look at what well, i mean okay classic case in point would be um the silk first silk road dread pirate robbers yeah. who hid behind encryption and tour and he was caught because one day he slipped and he went down to the public library and he logged on with his normal browser rather <sighs> through tour and that's how they got him yeah people make mistakes they get, instead they of using the up. dark web and using yeah. a vpn he did that yeah he was... it, i think nick belton formerly of the new york times now with vanity fair has a book out about the silk road mm. thing where it's coming out okay we there was to... a wired really long piece about it that was Really good. Yeah, I didn't get to read it, but it was here in San Francisco, right? The guy mm -hmm. was like in the Haight Ashbury. Yeah. And now all that stuff is coming through the dark web mm -hmm. with Zcash from China. So the fentanyl in the United States is being made in China and then being shipped here. Yeah. But I mean, we saw the same thing with Operation Playpen with the FBI, where they identified a, a child abuse image server. They. Um, seized the server they ran it themselves for 14 days took an a, install malware on the computers of people who were logging in and they've had hundreds of arrests from that this is doable without you know there's no need to throw everything out just to just to get some temporary idea of oh we're maybe a bit more secure but see that's a much more compelling argument than saying we all have to get used to living with increased terrorism Wow. I mean, increased terrorism? Seriously? More people were killed by vending machines last year than terrorists in the U.S. More people were killed by toddlers playing with guns. I mean, I don't understand why terrorism is blown up as this. Because it's terrorizing. Well, because they do it in a fashion but then you're to playing, make you terrorize. But then you're playing <laughs> the terrorist game for them. Right. You know, it's much... Yeah, no, it's, it's easier said <clears throat> than experienced. Like, it's pretty mm. terrorizing. I think it's... I mean, we are lucky that this has been few and far between here. But, but it's also not just terrorism. It's the cases of child abuse, for example. Yeah. You were mm. saying like it's it's not restricted to one type of crime. All crime is somehow involving technology these days because everybody has a phone and everybody has a computer. Here yeah. it is. Actually, it's been out, I guess, since May 2017. So it's a year old now. American Kingpin, the epic hunt for criminal mastermind, the criminal mastermind behind the Silk Road. You're going to read it and add it to your Built bookshelf? In. Well, I, I know Nick. We should have him on the podcast. He did the Hatching add Twitter book. Um but yeah, the, this guy was 26-year-old libertarian programmer, Ross Ulbrich. 
Yeah, I think libertarian and possibly pushing it, but yes. But I mean, the case in point, I, I interviewed the head of one of the Dutch uh, high-tech crime unit people. They shut down Alpha Bay uh, and a couple of other online drug suits. And it was just a question of going through, finding the weak points in their system. And then they ran the site themselves and then shut down one of them. So everyone rushed over to the other site and they got even more people in the net uh, and mass arrests have followed. What, is the Tor network compromised? Do you it think can that- be. It can be, but uh, if do you, you think get... the whole thing is a front for like the CIA, FBI, whatever? No, no. Uh, I mean, it's it's partially funded by the government, but it was built with all good intentions as a secure way. Um, Explain what it is to the audience um, and why the government would create something as insane as an <laughs> completely anonymous internet well, it's, it's, on the internet. It's it's very difficult to track, but uh, and, and it's very difficult and it. it but it's not impossible. Basically, you've got Tor nodes all around the world, and volunteers will run these nodes. And then from their you, home computer? Uh, from their home. A lot of libraries run it. Mm. Um, and it was initially funded by the U.S. government so that if you're, um, if you're say, a, a, democracy, a pro-democracy protester in Iran, or if you're a journalist in, in Myanmar, you can actually get online and have secure communications um, and not worry about the door being kicked in by the secret police. Um, now, obviously, criminals also um, sort of flock to this, but it's massively overstated. If you look at the amount of traffic from the tour, I mean, you speak to the tour people, f- about 5% of tour traffic is what you class as criminal. The biggest, the most visited website on tour is Facebook, by a huge margin. Um, it makes no sense. Why fa- would people go ch- through the tour network and mm. anonymize themselves to go to Facebook because they don't want to give data to Facebook. And, ah, so they yeah. use it like a VPN, like, so you don't yeah. know where I am. And Facebook to their, to, to their credit were one of the first major companies to set up a, set up a tour and onion where uh, they're called onion websites, but they yeah. said they, they set up a tour website and you know, people want to go on Facebook. They don't particularly want to give data to Facebook. They also don't want to give data to their ISP about what their Facebook account is. So Facebook is by far the most popular site. Facebook is so stupid sometimes. Like they could really just (laughs) end this entire debate by just if we all woke up next week. This is a message to Mark Zuckerberg. (laughs) Next week, I want you to implement Project JCal. Okay, I'm just gonna name it after myself, but that's okay. (laughs) Ten dollars a month. You have none of your data stored and no ads. Go for it. Mm. One or two percent of the audience will pay you. That means you will have uh, carry the two is two billion people, two billion people. Ten percent of two billion would be two hundred million. One percent would be twenty million. Yeah, twenty million times ten dollars, two hundred million, two point four billion dollars a year in pure profit. Mm. Okay. We've been pitched by a few internet search companies that are offering a subscription type model for that. Where they for, no ads and they won't track you supposedly. Yeah, like DuckDuckGo, yeah. I think has that model, but they yes. don't. Maybe they, but they don't have donations. But people don't value their privacy. Is the no, challenge. I know, but for, yeah. I think people do value not having ads. Sure. Hmm. So I pay for YouTube Red or whatever they call it, right. premium. Does it, you guys pay for that? No. You have to pay for this. It changes the entire experience of YouTube for ten bucks a month. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it's fifteen. You see no ads on Facebook. Which on then YouTube, means YouTube. on YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. sorry, nothing on YouTube. Then uh, you can use YouTube for like listening to music and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And when you'll use it more because yeah. there's no ads. So I consume a lot of my news by going to the news tab, mm. and I can watch all the CNN clips, all stuff with no ads. It's yeah. so nice. I mean, it's just buttery. Oh, so good. And then yeah. I use Ghostery, the Chrome extension. I don't yeah. know if you use that. But Ghostry blocks like almost everything. Mm-hmm. Just delightful. Okay, as we finish up here, um, there was a leak in the space station. <laughs> yes. And we have to pull up this video or this image because I read this as well. And they were trying to figure out what this drilled hole, and we'll pull it up in a second I think here. Drilled is up for debate, but yeah. Or this hole, yes, yeah. this hole in the space station. <laughs> oh, yeah, and it would have decompressed. Which they fixed with duct tape. Okay, so Ian, was this a Bond villain or a mistake? <laughs> what what is going on here? Okay, well, uh, first we thought it was a micrometeor meteorite, which is uh, you know a spe- micrometeorite meteorite. So basically, it's either a very small piece a of pebble. rock. 
Yeah, or in, in in a lot of cases, there's a chunk taken out of one of the windows of the International Space Station, which they think was caused by a chip of paint. But because it's travelling so fast, it's got enormous kinetic energy. So at first thought, this was a micrometer, some kind of micrometeorite. It's now been alleged that, because when they started showing pictures of it, and it was like, that doesn't look like a meteorite. That looks like a drill hole. So what they're suggesting now... So there it is. We're looking yeah. at it now. You There's see, if hole. it was a micrometeorite, it would have been splayed on the exit. On the, on the exit like thing. a bullet. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what they're but thinking But this is not happened, splayed. Yeah. So Good word. I haven't heard that <laughs> since like season two of Game of Thrones. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, so what they think possibly happened was... The engineer, one of the engineers putting this spacecraft together, drilled where he shouldn't have, and thought, well, it's a small hole. I'll just cover it over with glue and some, and, oh and some resin. And then once they got up into space, the glue started to disintegrate, and that's where you got the hole. So they have this marvelous tape. It's like duct tape, but and you can buy this stuff for $10, pounds a roll, $10 a roll, and I kind of want stuff. It's... Um, I forget the, the actual name of it, but it can survive. It, it'll still work in temperatures going from minus 200 to plus 400. And it's just, so they just whacked some tape across it yeah. and job done. You know, I mean, they weren't that worried about it because they found out, they noticed that the cabin pressure was dropping while the astronauts were asleep and decided to let them sleep uh, because it wasn't that big an issue. It would take like 20 days to depressurize the entire station. I think that this is kind of... A plot point in like four out of the seven alien movies is that there's a <laughs> hole in the side of the thing and it's decompressing, but that is bonkers. It just sounds more like a Malcolm Gladwell case study, you know. And... Mm. Yes. But yeah, but that, here's the thing that looks yeah. machined. Nobody yeah. knew if it was an accident or sabotage. Today on Revisionist History, a podcast for that was good. curious people. I'm working on my. What happened to your other DJ voice though? No, that's my Malcolm Gladwell, yeah. like, mm. you know, pretentious yeah. host, like with like, this is the most important story you've ever heard that you've never heard. But I just default to my Trump because that's perfect. <laughs> all right, this has been an amazing episode. The best voice, the best The greatest voice episode of all podcasts. Everybody knows that there was no collusion. And if there was, it'd be okay. If, it was, if there was, it'd be okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows I'm doing a great job and the stock market's going to crash if you impeach me. Nice Thank you, Clara me. Brenner, for being on the podcast again, managing partner at the Urban Innovation Fund. If you need $500,000 or a million bucks to make cities more livable and awesome, she's got it. She's always got, always have two or three I of those it. checks in, in the my purse. Right now. right now. Just ready to go. Mm-hmm. Just tell her the name of the company and she'll ship it. Ian Thompson, of course, writing for the register. And saying all kinds of interesting things on this program. Like <laughs> the 12 pounds in a 10 pound bag was, I think that was the most memorable we've had in a long time. October 10th and 11th, launch scale equity crowdfunding with Seed Invest, live pitching and mentorship on stage with me, Jason Calacanis. Apply at launchscale.net slash crowdfunding. What that means is if you need money, you go to launchscale.net slash crowdfunding and you can crowdfund. Crowdfunding is when you let equity crowdfunding. All investors, including non-accredited and accredited, invest in your company. This is an awesome thing to do. I just did it for Inside.com. We invited all the readers of Inside to invest, and we raised over $2 million, and we used Seed Invest, the platform. Very cool company. My friend Ryan runs. So go to launchscale.net slash crowdfunding and apply to be live on stage doing equity crowdfunding and get mentorship from me. Your boy, J. Cal. All right. <laughs> Can't even take it. <laughs> Uh, and if you want some tickets, uh, we gave away, I think, all the free passes, 1,500 of them, or 2,000 free passes. But if you want to buy a ticket, they're affordable. Go to launchgale.net slash tickets, and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.